Christian Podcast. Great to have you watching and listening wherever you're at today. And uh, Dave, the last couple of weeks, some good interviews. Uh, James Brian Smith, Brian's on last week. So yeah, it's it's we're in a good good uh, good rhythm here. Yeah, I've, I've appreciated their content and uh, just do you do you get questions from people that you hang out with? So like people will come to me a day or two or three afterwards, and they'll they'll ask me questions. Uh, sometimes oh, almost uncomfortable. I don't know exactly what to say. Uh, I was like, oh, I should have asked them that or something like that. But uh, do you get a lot of like in-person interaction with people? Yeah, I've, sometimes. I've been sh- yeah. And, and it, it, yeah, it's cool. Like I, I really, like I say every week, I just so appreciate having these discussions and dialogues with people because you get to interact with people that have so many different backgrounds. We were just sharing with our guests who I'll introduce in a second here, but um, you know, we came more from a Methodist background, but interacting with people from reformed, charismatic, um, various backgrounds, you name it. Um, and it's just, it's just so informative and helpful to kind of gain different perspectives. Yeah. The technology makes it possible for us Mm. to, we don't have to like meet them in person for us to have a substantive conversation and you get introduced to a lot of folks as writing, that yeah. I probably wouldn't have, and even just the the folks that they reference in their writing, yeah, you, you just get exposed, and I think it brings clarity, especially around. It makes you aware, maybe of, of of topics that are going on that maybe in your little bubble, it's not even a discussion, but in the larger section of Christendom, maybe a lot of folks are talking about something. It just makes you aware. Um, I think it's a good thing. Well, we're a hundred and I think one hundred and four episodes in now. First guest I think we've ever had from Nebraska. So here we go. We should keep track of what, what states we're covering here. But Jake Meter, the editor in chief of Mere Orthodoxy, an online magazine covering the Christian faith in the public sphere, and a contributing editor with Plow. His first book was In Search of the Common Good. Um, and then he's recently written a book, What Are Christians for? Life Together at the End of the World. So kind of a thought-provoking title there. I like books with thought-provoking title titles. And a great writer, very great communicator, as we both noted um, offline before uh, before doing this. So Jake Meter, welcome to the Monday Christian Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Lincoln, Nebraska. Wow. <laughs> so our very first guest, I think, from this from this state. So... This is this is this is big Pressure, stuff. Pressure's on. <laughs> is this, is there a lot going on in Lincoln? Be honest, Jake. What's going on in Lincoln? I mean, it's a university town with three hundred thousand people and tech scenes. I mean, in ways that I'm kind of sad about, looks very like a typical Big Ten town these days. So. Yeah. <laughs> so if you drive like fifteen minutes in either direction, is it suburbs or is it like what we all think it probably is? So my, um, my, I would say huge college town, and then if you get too far out, it would be just like farmland everywhere. Is that a bad if assumption? If you did 15 minutes from our house, you would still be in the city in just about every direction because we live right near downtown. But oh, yeah, wow. I mean, if you if you drove 15 minutes from my parents' place, they're out in a old railroad town that the city annexed about 80 years ago. You could drive 10 minutes north or east from there, and you'd be in farm farmland, yeah. Talk so when you go to and speak at different places, what's the biggest misconception people have <laughs> of Lincoln, Nebraska? Because I get this being in Idaho now. I moved from Toronto, Canada to Idaho, and people are like, mm-hmm. Idaho, isn't that like isn't that Potatoes. like near Iowa or something like that? And I'm like, no, actually it's right next to California. <laughs> yeah. Um, biggest misconception. I, I don't know. I've I don't know if it's because of the way media culture has changed or because we have a lot of tech stuff here now, but I don't hear as many things these days as I feel like we're kind of like, I remember hearing stories in the like nineties and two thousands about football recruits coming out here and being surprised there was electricity on campus, but I don't really hear (laughs) stuff like that anymore. Um, I mean, in some ways like, right No, I mean, there's a, a kind of hub of Midwestern towns that, combine a lot of the like university and tech stuff you get in bigger coastal cities with Mm -hmm. way lower cost of living um so lincoln would be in that same kind of ballpark um a little bit like not like the twin cities but like if you just had saint paul minnesota without the rest of the twin cities that's similar to lincoln in a lot of ways so So your upbringing then how did you come to faith in christ what did that look like um 
Yeah, so I grew up in the church, but I grew up in a pretty unhealthy kind of fundamentalist church. Um, they broke off from the Plymouth Brethren, I believe, in the yeah, 60s. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Um, and so just a lot of really, really unhealthy um, kind of schismatic attitudes toward other Christians. Um, some really weird theological stuff going on as well. And so I like grew up in that world and I was kind of knew how to follow the rules. I have a good, I have a talent for memory. And so I could memorize verses really well. And so if you're good at Bible memory and you're a real follower in that kind of church, you're kind of the golden child. Mm -hmm. um, and then in middle school, my friend group, we all kind of scattered in different directions. And I was pretty isolated, pretty lonely. I was at a private Christian school that just had out of control bullying way worse than anything I've ever, I ever encountered in public schools. Um, and during that time, I also, I was in middle school, I had found porn online and my parents found out not too long after, thankfully. Um, and kind of in the midst of all of that uncertainty and a lot of guilt, um, it was kind of the first time I think that Christian faith and the gospel was like something I needed. Hmm. Um, I think prior to that, I knew the right answers. I knew how to behave. I knew what I was supposed to do. And so I knew how to fit in in the church, but I didn't necessarily understand why I needed. Because, I mean, I, I was the good kid. Um, yeah. I was the kid that finished my Awana memory book like a month before anyone else. And so it, there was never a real sense of need when... Um, we would talk about sin and the cross and the gospel. Um, right. But I think in middle school, I kind of discovered that need in a variety of ways. And so that was when it started. And perhaps not surprisingly, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, like the day I became a Christian was kind of the beginning of the end for me in that church. Hmm. And the, the, the more serious I became about trying to look like Jesus, the harder it got to belong to that church. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting you mentioned kind of the upbringing. I didn't know that about you. Um, when I was growing up, so I did a lot of youth camps, uh, Bible quizzing, things like that. I remember spending just hours and hours uh, studying the Bible and studying Scripture. And there were parts of that were, that were just so, I think, so foundational and helpful because you lean on that, right, later going mm -hmm. back on life. But as, at the time, you just sometimes don't know how to piece that together as well as you'd like. And, and sometimes it almost not... A, I don't want to say like it was another conversion experience for me. It wasn't really that, mm -hmm. but there were moments later on where you start to realize, oh, okay, so I learned this, but I didn't, I didn't really internalize that. And a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so part of the thing that was vital for me is that I was in a very healthy home, mm -hmm. and so even though church was a hindrance to following Jesus, my home never was. Um, and as I was kind of going through, I mean, if this was in 2005, 2006, what today would called deconstruction, like, as I was going through that process, my parents were very patient. They trusted me. They gave me space. They tried to do what they could to be helpful. They made it clear that I was always going to have a place at home. Like, I mean, we had, we had kids who would leave and their families would shun them. And yeah. so my parents made it clear, like, that was never going to be what happened with us. Um, and so Without there was shunning this... or just kind of more like... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I have many memories after I left mm. of, like, being on campus, because I went to UNL right here in town, and being on campus, and I'd see somebody that I grew up with, and they'd make eye contact with me, and then they'd turn and walk the other way. Really? And like my mm. parents, well, after my, my parents have left the church as well, and they actually had a pastor's wife yell at them in the parking lot at a mall here in town yeah. over it. So, yeah, I mean, it was yeah. not a good place. Um, That's unfortunate, right? But, because like I, I think scripture memory is great, but if it's not done in the context of grace and if it's not, it's like if it's, if it's like five degrees off, <laughs> that, that thing becomes yeah. almost like a barrier and you you end up mm -hmm. becoming really good at looking some sort of part without without right. actually having any sort of relationship it, with, it's a kind of God. inoculation yeah um, 
because you come away thinking you know what Christianity is. I've I've had so many interactions with like this over the years because unsurprisingly, probably 85% of the kids I grew up with are no longer Christian. Um, wow, and that's a high like number. The, yeah. yeah, the school that I went to here in town is kind of the same story. They, A lot of the folks that come out of that school, they either do the same kind of like, I don't want to judge their personal faith, but to look at it, very performative kind of faith, or you're going to apostatize. Those are kind of the two outcomes. Yeah, um, And so I have so many conversations with people that grew up in church, they grew up in Christian schools, and they have a lot of Bible verses in their head, but they don't actually know Christian doctrine very well. Yes, um, They don't understand kind of Christian patterns of thinking and habits of mind. And yeah. yet, because of that background, they think they do. Yeah. And so it, it's one of the like hardest kind of conversations to have because it really like they've kind of been inoculated to it I, yeah and i think jake yeah. i think i i almost avoid or truncate those conversations unless i really feel led to to really dive in with somebody because mm -hmm. if you have a few proof texts you know right from a bunch of different things you sort of cobbled together to sort of confirm your embedded theology to sort of renovate that takes a lot of work and like to your point mm -hmm. i don't actually think they know much about christian meta narrative i don't think right. that historic christian faith rooted you know in, in something like well is this we're talking about this thing here how important is that because in my context it's super important but mm -hmm. i'm like did it make it into a creed okay step oh, one yeah. <laughs> okay oh, no. so I like mean, we were that's like arch dispensationalists and so, right, and for those in our audience, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right, right. <laughs> um, or something. Yeah, well, so like if you're familiar with the Left Behind series, it's the mm -hmm. kind of theory of last things that is fictionalized in the Left Behind books. And Wait, so, so yeah, that was I mean, fiction. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Oh, no, so I'll get into conversations with folks. And like, it's a really, they have memories of it being a really big deal if you thought Jesus came back before the rapture or midway through the tribute, the seven year tribulation, like this was a big thing. And our church broke fellowship with other mm -hmm. churches over this yeah. issue. Yeah. And I will tell them, you know, no one in church history believed in the, rap the rapture before like 1850 and their jaws will kind of drop a little bit. Cause in their head, that was like, if you get that wrong, are you even a Christian? And it's like, well, if you have to believe in our church's understanding of the rapture to be a Christian, there were no Christians before like 1850. Um, and it just highlights the blessing people. of the time that we live in, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least we were born after 1850. Yeah, sorry, I got to drive. Dave <laughs> <so. laughs> uh, is used to it, I but suppose. I have to explain it sometimes. I suppose. But, no, no, yeah. no. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. But yeah, so it's. It's very hard. It makes me mm. extremely sad. Um, yeah. There's so many people that I know and care about deeply. Hmm. Um, and in many ways, I think they're better people, like having left the faith than they were while they were practicing. And Man. that can sound really jarring to people who don't have that kind of background. And I would want to qualify that claim in all kinds of ways to like tidy right, up some right, of the theological right. issues. But just in terms of like my day to day experience of them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just a really hard thing. And I think it it's driven me, especially in the last few years, I think more and more to prayer. Yeah. Because um, I don't know what else to do with it, I guess. It's, you... it's interesting, Jake, because we, like last week we brought in Brian Sand, and he talked about um, just kind of his journey. Forty, I think it was around forty years of age. He kind of had an aha moment where he's like, "Man, a lot of this stuff that I thought I've believed, I I just really don't. I, I question it." And goes through kind of a, he wouldn't call it deconstruction, but maybe a renovation phase. I guess he would he would more use. Um, and so he goes through this phase where he, he tears down some of those things and. Uh, in our conversation, we admitted, hey, listen, I would land differently than you on some of the places you land today. Great conversation on that. But do you ever uh, think of it as fortunate that, like uh, I do, and some of my experiences, that you came to this, I don't know, deconstruction phase, if you will, at a young age that you did? Like, how has that shaped you, like, as opposed to it happening um, when you were later on in life? That's a good question. 
so I, I think it's for me the gratitude is less about age per se and more that I came to it when I was still at home with the parents that I had because hmm. um, they didn't try to flatten all of that like they didn't tell me I couldn't read that book or I shouldn't have that question or right. I just needed stronger faith and then I wouldn't have these issues. Um, they respected me. They trusted me. They gave me space. And yet they were still, there was still that presence with them. There were still the routines of our family life. Um, and I imagine that would have provided a stability for me just to be working through those questions in a place where I already knew I was loved. Mm. Um, because I think for a lot of folks, it, I mean, I know it, like, I, I know people who asked the same questions that I did were reading the same things that I was and it cost them their families. Hmm. Um, I've known people it cost them their job. Um, and so I think because I was at home, because I had parents who loved me, because home was safe, the questioning and the doubting could actually be about the issues interesting. Um, without it also becoming this thing where there was tons of motivated reasoning going on to drive me to sit different things and a lot of angst and fear. I mean, it, it's an angsty, fearful thing to be going through to begin with, but I was able to just have like that be the thing and not have all the other stuff that often surrounds it. Um, and yeah. I think if I had gone through, like I continued going through that process in college, but I think if I had started it in college or I'd had a different home background, college would have been way messier for me than it was. A lot of, a lot of the folks that so I was talking to a local pastor here and his congregation, um, for whatever reason, they've had a lot of college kids come through that are talking about an experience like yours, but without... Mm -hmm sort of home support or without a good right. community support. And he said, sadly, a lot of, a lot of these folks renovating, deconstructing, having doubts, deconstruct right past their congregation into, into the nuns category, you know, that mm -hmm. everyone's sort of concerned about. So I guess my question for you is how do we help folks ask real good questions? How do we shepherd in community? How do we, allow space for people to have these times of questions without it constantly leading to perpetual doubt and eventual mm -hmm. um, abandonment of, of Christian faith. Yeah. So, man, I've got a lot of different ideas as we're, as I'm thinking here. Um, we're running an essay by an Australian pastor named Mark Sayers in a fourth, we have a print issue of Mere Orthodoxy now, as well as Web. Um, and he's going to have an essay in a forthcoming issue on discipleship in a polarized world. Um, so I was just talking about some of this stuff with him the other day as we were discussing the essay. Um, I think one of the problems that COVID didn't create but exposed um, is that for a lot of people, church has basically been content. Um, it's some inspirational music and inspirational message. And then I leave. Um, and there's like, so like the church we go to has a very traditional liturgy that also includes like, we confess our sin together as a congregation. We kneel, um, we extend our hands to receive the benediction at the end of the service. We have the Lord's supper every week. Um, so for us, the move to online, which we, we did online church for a while during COVID out of necessity um, to comply with local laws, but there was a felt difference between Sunday morning gatherings in person and what we were doing online. Um, I think in a lot of cases there wasn't necessarily. And now the church, church was still content, but now it was online and it was competing with everything else online and it's going to lose. Um, the other thing that happens is when church is content, um, you've got as a pastor or a church leader, you've got hour, hour and a half a week with your congregation. 
they are going to spend many times more than that with cable news, with social media, yes. with whatever they're reading online. And you're going to lose because there's no way your church could give people enough content to outcompete MSNBC or Fox News or Twitter or Facebook or what have you. And quality content. I think that's the key, right? Quality. Mm-hmm. Like you, you can, and, and I'm, I'm what I mean by quality content, but like, like you can't compete like stylistically wise. Highly produced, user. right? They yeah, highly the produced. produced. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And so like Sayers thinks that one of the effects of this is likely going to be that churches are necessarily going to have to become smaller because you can't like the church's content game is something that plays very well to mega churches, to video preaching, to things like that. Um, but if you have to think about something different and we're not going to do church's content anymore, well, then what are we doing? And it's probably going to be something smaller. Um, another thought, and this is also from Sayers, um, he talks about how societies of abundance um, tend to, like, we always have to have something to fight about in our politics, but the things that a society of abundance fights about are different than the thing that a society of scarcity fights about. Can you explain um, that? What do you mean? What do you mean? So if you were to talk to um, somebody who's working class here in Lincoln, who is struggling to pay their bills, um, works a hard job. We had a, a neighbor um, at the last place we lived who worked in a cold storage unit um, on the edge of town. It was a hard job. Um, he, his girlfriend that he was living with didn't have a reliable employment situation and they had two kids they were trying to provide for. Um, and he wasn't in great health. The kind of things that he is going to be activated by politically are different than the things that a creative class worker in Manhattan or Seattle, or even a, a creative class worker in downtown Lincoln will be activated by. So somebody, a creative class worker at a tech hub in Lincoln might get really, really up in arms about whether or not the Disney corporation is woke. Um, my neighbor with the cold storage job does not care. Mm. It just is not on his, like he's trying to yeah. figure out how to provide for his family. He yep. doesn't care if they say ladies and gentlemen or friends at mm-hmm. Disneyland. Um, yeah. And so, but what happens then in those kind of cultures of scarcity is you are looking for narratives to kind of give your life a sense of significance, a sense of direction, meaning, purpose. And what I think we're seeing right now in the U.S. is that politics is what is providing that for most people. And you can see it on the right um, with a lot of the fervor around President Trump when he was campaigning and then when he was in office. Um, you can see it on the left with a lot of the fervor around trans issues, for example. Um, and so I think the challenge for Christians is we need to have a better narrative that we can present to people than what they're getting via these other voices in the culture. Um, and so to take one example that's come up a couple times in conversations I've had recently, like something that has driven me crazy at times in the PCA, it's my home um, church communion, the Presbyterian Church in America. It's where uh, Tim Keller is a yeah. pastor. Um, you can get into PCA churches where, for example, when we end up talking about sexuality stuff, um, you can hear a pastor talk about it and you almost get the idea that he he feels bad about what Paul said. And so there's this sense of like, you know, I really wish we could be more inclusive and we could be more affirming, but darn it, that old Paul just won't let us. And so here we are. Hands are tied. It's the best we can do. Our hands are tied. Um, That suggests that not even the pastor thinks what Christianity says about sex is good news because he feels bad about it. Yeah. Um, And so I think if we are able to recognize that Christianity is good news and be able to talk about it that way. And and we need to be able to do it in ways that cut against both kind of 
political or class groups that are kind of ascendant right now, because I think if you were to simply take something like Mary's Magnificat in Luke, the end of Luke one, um, the prayer that she says when she encounters Elizabeth, um, if you were to read the Magnificat in a lot of conservative churches without telling people that it was from the Bible, they would call you a socialist. They would shout you down. You'd be woke. You'd be a progressive. And then it would turn out, oops, you're quoting Mary, the mother of God from Luke one, and it's in the Bible. And now we're going to have fun. Um, and so I think we need to be able to believe ourselves that what Christianity says about um God, about his works, about our bodies, about our work, our money. Um, we need to believe ourselves that that is good news. And we need to be inviting other people into communities that are practicing that good life, born of that good news together. And so it just entails a commitment to, I think, face-to-face -face interaction, to hospitality, um, and to discipleship that has often been lacking in recent years because church has just been content. Um, and you when sure. churches, oh, go ahead. So, so you're going through some of the chapters, which cover okay in your book, what are Christians <laughs> for life together at the end of the world. So you're, you, you hit on a wide variety of, of different, different um, challenges, I would say in, in the West before you get into those, you were on a plane ride. I want you to start with this because you <laughs> shared with us in the introduction. Yes. And I think I this is story. fascinating from South Africa. I'll <laughs> yes. let you pick it up from yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, and one of so our I blog see. contributors, Jeremy Howard, uh, he lived in South Africa for quite a while. His wife's from there. So anyways, it's, oh, this is good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I sit down on this plane flying from Joburg to London, and I was mortified to realize I had overestimated the time of the flight after the book had gone to press. So it's actually not as long as I said in the book regrettably and i just missed it oh well, how long but it's still i think it's like a 13 hour flight or something like that and i think i said 18 in the book okay maybe it just felt long because that's a long time to be long. Long. yeah maybe yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so this elderly gentleman sits down next to me and black shirt collar unbuttoned we start talking and he kind of has this mischievous sense of humor and asks and i tell him i'm a student he asks or i ask him what he does and he asks me to guess. So I start going down the list and eventually he's a priest, a Catholic priest. And he'd been in South Africa for like 50 some years, he told me. I remember it was 40 years. And then as he's kind of seems to be going to sleep, I remember thinking like he was a South African, he was a white Roman Catholic priest in South Africa during apartheid. I wonder what he was doing. Um, and so I turn an in-flight movie on just what else am I going to do? Cause I'm not tired yet. Um, called cry freedom. And it's the story of a black anti-apartheid activist named Steve Biko, who um, he actually, I believe he was someone who coined the phrase black is beautiful. Um, there's a lot of overlap between Biko's thought and what you'd get from somebody like W.E.B. Du Bois in the U S um, radical. He gets murdered by the South African police and a white Catholic journalist named Donald Woods, um, is a friend of Biko's and is trying to tell Steve's story, but he gets put under house arrest and the government is intimidating him. They go after his kids. His daughter gets really bad chemical burns because of a t-shirt <laughs> that they sent her that had Biko's face on it. And she went to put it on and burned her skin really bad all around her eyes. And so he decides he needs to leave the country and so he arranges to borrow a priest friend's passport and disguise himself as the priest and get out. And so I watch the movie and then I go to sleep and we wake up in the morning and Father Ted is sitting next to me and he asked me what I thought of the movie and I tell him I liked it. And he, I ask him if he's seen it before and he goes, oh, yes, I know the story well. <laughs> so then we start talking and eventually he asks me, did you see the, the note in the movie that asked if or that said there were two names changed to protect the identities of the of people involved with the story and i said i kind of remember that and he goes well one of them was mine and i kind of like tilt my head a little bit he goes well, perked up a little bit at that point yeah yeah I, i'm the priest who gave donald my passport so that he could escape the country 
<laughs> and so then the rest of the flight into Heathrow, I'm like talking his ear. Well, I'm asking lots of questions. I don't know how much I was talking. Um, just asking him questions about what that was like. And um, he was just an ordinary Catholic priest who kept his head down for the most part, didn't want to attract a lot of attention, worked in townships. He also worked for a, a while out in rural parts of the country. Um, he did some Bible translation work um, for people in rural parts of South Africa with the different kind of dialects that he had learned while he was ministering there. But then when he had this close friend who needed, he, whose life was in danger, the South African police were brutal. His life was in danger. He had a lot of good work he could do outside of the country for justice. Um, he risked everything basically. Cause I mean, if, Donald had been caught, he had Father Ted's passport. So it would not have been hard to figure out who was yeah. helping him. And so Father Ted could easily have been imprisoned for a long time or murdered himself, um, just as Biko had been. Um, but the South Africans didn't catch him and Woods escaped. And Father Ted's story basically stayed unknown until he died a couple years ago. Um, it was actually kind of interesting because since I was working on the book, I did some poking around online just to see if I could learn anything else about him. And there is basically nothing about him prior to like 2018 because hmm. he just didn't want anyone to know. He wanted to just be a regular parish priest. And after he died, Donald Woods, his children started talking about him and sharing his story. So I got wow. to hear about it in 2007 from him when he was still living. So, so how did that encounter shape so, your writing here? Um, what I loved about it is that there's so much of Father Ted's ministry was extremely ordinary. It's preaching the gospel. It's administering the Eucharist, baptizing people, hearing confessions, just regular pastoral stuff. And he also did some fundraising for some various kind of ministries he had going in townships in South Africa during apartheid. All, all really, really banal, mundane stuff. And yet, like the, the way I see this divide often break in the US is there's this kind of like, you're either a political revolutionary or you're a quietist and there's not really any, any in between. And what I saw in Father Ted was the courage of a political revolutionary um, courage that goes beyond the courage of most political revolutionaries, I think. Um, and yet he wasn't, it, politics was not like the air that he breathed every day. But when he saw the opportunity to do something to promote justice, um, to combat evil, he did it. But for the most part, he had a pretty ordinary, quiet, faithful ministry for 50 years in anonymity, 15-hour um, plane ride from where he was born. Like, he just labored quietly and faithfully. And so I think what would go a very long way to helping our churches become healthier is if we had the commitment to modesty and quiet, faithful living that Father Ted exemplified but also the courage and commitment to justice um, that he also had. Um, it doesn't have to be an either or thing. It can be both. Um, and, Dave, I'm curious your thoughts, thoughts on this, because I, I think, you know, Jake, I'm, I would say it seems like the people that can be the, the, the greatest up in arms about things, I, I wonder sometimes where they would be at if push really came to shove. Right. right right now we love Vladimir Zelensky in some respects mm -hmm. just, just of all that he's he's done and we would admire that kind of courage that he's shown in Ukraine in the midst of adversity but mm -hmm. would we really show that I mean I think at a recent poll I don't know how accurate it was but how many Americans would actually you know stay in and defend their country right if, if push came to shove right and sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder about that in terms of Christi Christians right would we actually mm -hmm. uh, Dave your thoughts I think you see in Jesus this sort of both and. and I, I love Jake's writing about this because he talks about almost, I think the word you use is like a buffer, or there's like a lot of Christians have been insulated from a part of 
formative discipleship. Like, no, what you do in the public square really matters. You need to have courage and be thoroughly Christian there. And, Mm -hmm. oh, by the way, that's probably going to mean that everybody hates you. Like, any extreme is going to hate you. Like, you're you're Mm -hmm. a communist or... Um, you're a you're a right wing, uh, yeah, somebody that takes the Bible too seriously or something. Right, right. And I think yes. Dave, Dave there, finish your thought. I want to read a quote real quick, right along with what you're saying from the book. It says, "Much Christian discipleship in American churches has been based on the assumption that whatever discipleship looks like, it won't look like something that disrupts Americans' business and financial life. Whatever discipleship looks looks like, it can't be something that disrupts a comfortable." privatized existence full of personal amusements and hobbies. Whatever discipleship looks like, it can't be something that would cost us the personal peace and influence that we assume is our birthright as Americans. Mm -hmm. So kind of to your point there. Yeah, I think it's a a Christianity that uh, apparently there's no cross with it, right? Like there's no cost. You know, I'm thinking of Bonhoeffer. Of course, he's gotten a lot of airtime in the last few years, but just the idea in some of his cost to decide, like we want this sort of insulated thing where either we can do the quietest thing, we can be personally uh, have tons of piety and sort of live in a corner and do our own like desert monastic thing, or Mm -hmm. we're constantly advocating for change in the public arena. And there's little um, formation or Christ likeness behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. It's like it's advocate advocacy for social change minus this deep formation. I, that's why I really, Jake, honestly appreciate your writing. I, some of the chapters are just, I mean, the chapter content, the whole the whole concept, the unmaking, you, you, your critiques of the, I know we're going to get into that, Ez, but I just, <laughs> fast, the way it connects to your, like, premise there in the introduction or whatever, in the first few pages, I think it was like nine or ten maybe, but uh, it, it was just spot on, and uh, yeah, you should read Jake's book. <laughs> Thank you. That's kind. If you were to sit down across the coffee shop conversation, Jake, you know, someone comes up to you and they're like, hey, all right, there's a lot of things wrong with the church, right? Kind of kind of one of those people, right? There's a lot of things wrong. Mm-hmm. How would you fix it? And you got like a minute, right? Now, but what what, what would be the core, the, the key things, the, the key things, the top two or three things that you say, man, as practical Monday Christians, we could do differently, Um to better represent Christ. I'm kind of reminded there's the old story. People would ask Francis Schaeffer sometimes, if you had an hour to sit down with somebody and talk to them about the gospel, what would you say? And Schaefer would always say, I'd spend about the first 50 minutes listening and asking questions. <laughs> and then I'd spend the last 10 talking. Um, so part of me, I would just want to know where they're coming from, what they are seeing. Um, I mean, I even like I have people that write for me that did their academic training in mainline institutions, and they are in very similar places that I am theologically, and yet they've gotten there through very different routes. And so the dangers that they're alert to are not the dangers that I'm necessarily the first to notice. Um, That said, the the thoughts that come to mind for me, um, one would be that I think Christian liturgy, it's not the like universal silver bullet that fixes everything, but a well-structured liturgy can do a lot. Um, You know, we have like at our church, we say the Lord's prayer or the apostles creed basically every week. Um, We confess our sin as a congregation and we kneel every week we stand and hear the good news that our sins are forgiven through Christ. Um, To be reminded of those things every week, to be grounded in those basic Christian texts and prayers, I think is really powerful. And so I, one of the things I would say is like, you should be doing the Lord's supper every week. You're, you're, you should have the experience of receiving food from your King every week to nourish Amen. you in your journey. <laughs> um, I think another thing is we need to try and find ways to make it easier for Christians to be together and to support each other in day-to-day life. Probably that is going to mean living relatively close together. Um, 
because otherwise commute times, especially when combined with work, just make community very, very difficult. Um, we've been very blessed. We have some neighbors. Um, they're Pentecostals, so we go to different churches, but they're a wonderful family that we're close to that we kind of stumbled into when we moved into this house. Um, and there's a, a community that our kids are just going to grow up having like I didn't grow up having because we didn't really have any Christian friends in our neighborhood. Um, and my kids are just going to have a different kind of experience with that growing up. So I think that would be another, that would be one thing. Um, I mean, the other thing, this gets a little bit more radical, but I think we're in times where we need to be entertaining radicalism um, of a certain type. You know, I, I think about, I, I so I work for Plow as a contributing editor, and that's published by a radical Anabaptist community called the Bruderhof. Um, you can basically understand the Bruderhof by saying, like, they read Acts 2 and 4 and say, okay, let's go do that, guys. Uh, <laughs> so that's what they do. So they have these communities of hundreds of Christians living together. They renounce private property when they join the community. They share all of the money that their work brings in in a common purse um they renounce violence like i mean they have readings of some different theological questions that i would differ from um because i'm i'm a, i buy the just war argument personally but um the kind of simple like it, it reminds me in many ways of what i experienced growing up at home this sense of like if jesus said it if the bible said it it's just what we're gonna do and there's not questions about, well, what will this mean for our bank account? Or we really don't want to give this thing up. Or I really want to stay in this job. Like, it's just not a question. It's just, well, no, that's what the Bible said. So we're going to go do it. Um, okay, Jake, and so, I, yeah, yeah, sorry. I know, Dave, you got to follow up. But like, we talk about proximity. Can we do that in a rural context? I mean, you're Lincoln, <laughs> Nebraska, but 300,000 people. Um, I've given this a lot of thought, right? In mm -hmm. moving from Toronto, Canada, out to Idaho. And mm -hmm. the challenge, I would say, obviously, in the church sometimes is is there's such a disparity, such a disconnect between Christians, I would say, in rural America, as opposed to um, some some inner city contexts, such as New York, LA, so forth. Mm -hmm. um, what's proximity look like for you? City context or not necessarily? Yeah, it, these are the things that are going to have to get prudentially worked out by every community, I think. So in Lincoln, you can get just about anywhere in town within about 20, 20, 25 minutes of driving, probably. Um, we have quite a few friends. Our church is about five minutes away and we have quite a few people that are within 10 minutes of us. Um, but I also don't think we've done as well with community stuff as I would like. That's something my wife and I are talking about all the time and we're trying to figure out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if it's a, if it's a 10 minute drive, if it's the sort of thing where like you can imagine calling somebody up and saying like, I have to bring my car in for an oil change. It'll probably yeah, be about right. 45 minutes. Right. I'd love to get some time with you. Would you just want to, like, can I pick you up and you just come along and we'll catch up that way. Um, I think you want to live close enough to people that you can do that kind of stuff. Cause otherwise you have to plan every gathering right. and people are busy and you won't plan and then you won't see people. So no, it's just something I thought about. Cause you know, I don't, I don't want to yeah. just have surface level online relationships, mm -hmm. right. I want to have deep, meaningful proximate mm -hmm. relationships. So yeah. Dave, I know you had a follow up thought on that. Yeah. So you're mentioning, uh, we, we need to speak clearly about what Jesus said and not, not shy away from that. So you mm -hmm. gave this example earlier of the, the pastor who sort of apologetically says, well, Paul said this, so I guess, which I don't think that has a <laughs> shelf life. That's not going to last very long. I'm pretty sure yeah. there's going to be some, some significant change. So how do we, in this culture, have the courage to actually be clear about some things? So like, yeah, Paul said this, and this is good news, right? So how do we say that? Mm -hmm. On the other side not being a big J jerk and smacking people with Paul. I think there's both extremes. Right. Oh, and I don't, course. I yeah, don't yeah. see many people I grew sitting up with the other extreme more. Yeah. yeah. I think as, like, and I probably were yeah. more in that vein than 
um, mm-hmm. the sort of apology. But I think both extremes are extremely problematic, and we live in such a mushy culture with, if, if you want to talk a lot of places, can attract an audience by saying things that are spiritual platitudes that really don't have any depth to them. So mm-hmm. how do we speak clearly in like how do we how do we do that because i just don't see very many people having the courage to say it or they yeah. say it and they're off putting because they don't represent the tone or character of christ when they say it you know is that too much to ask like can we have both i don't think it should be too much to ask it seems like it's kind of the biblical expectation i mean like not being domineering is a qualification for eldership in the pastoral epistles um there are presbyteries in my church community where a lot of guys would have to repent if we took that qualification seriously. Um, probably every presbytery has those issues, but I can like, there's certain presbyteries where like domineering is almost seen as a leadership asset. <laughs> and yet typically yeah. it's disqualifying from leadership according to Paul. Um, so no, I don't think it's too much to ask. I think it's what scripture expects. Um, I guess, so one thought is when you're called to take risk, um, your ability and willingness to take risk is related to the kind of security that you have to catch you if things go badly. Wow. Um, And so now in one sense, even if you don't have any like local kind of like people that are your safety net, you have Christ. And because you have Christ, all things are yours. No good thing will be lost and you will rise with him one day. And there's nothing more certain you can have as you go out and take risks than that. Um, That being said, it is not wrong to say that Christians should be prepared to help each other bear risk together. Um, I had a good friend who could easily have lost his job because he did not agree to sign on to a company's diversity statement. Um, And he went to HR and talked about it and they worked it out and he was able to keep his job. Um, If he had lost his job over that, I see it as a church's duty (laughs) to rally behind that family and provide support however they're able to. Um, even, but I mean, it's also, I mean, it's kind of the Daniel three thing with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, like they are speaking back to Nebuchadnezzar and at the end of it all, they say, but even if our God does not rescue us, he is still the true God. Um, and so even if you can't call back on that, you still like, I mean, Luther would say, I, I would remind himself of his baptism. I'm a baptized child of God. Um, that's my security. That's my grounds for courage. That's why I can take risk. Um, that's why you can be willing. Like uh, Wendell Berry has this great interview where he talks about being willing to be run over by the locomotive of history. Um, if you're willing to be run over, you can do all kinds of things <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's the threat of getting running up, getting run over that keeps people from taking risk. But if you're willing to do that, then there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, and I think if you're doing that well, then there's going to be times where you're going to have people that think you're weak on X, you didn't take a hard enough line here. And then there's going to be other times where people think they were really offended by what you said and think you're, yeah, you know, I mean, we, we all know the scripts at this point. Like, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, we know how these things go. Um, well, it's a conversation Dave so, and I have had in regard to the podcast, right? Because we bring on different people from all different backgrounds, sure. yeah, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. sometimes I think people, I, well, I know this because I grew up in a little bit of a culture of this where sometimes it's guilt by association, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so someone might dig up whatever someone's posted on social media that we've invited on the podcast and say, so you support this? I'm like, uh, no, but they had a great you know, take on x topic right my yeah. tweets delete once a week so oh, do they really? <laughs> that's probably that's probably really <laughs> smart but like honestly the, the truth is when you talk with somebody especially in a public setting i mean it's something that you have to be aware of right because i mean we had a i mean as already mentioned we had brian zahn on the podcast last week yeah. and like i think his takes on patriotism nationalism 
the difference are so good. And then some of the other stuff he said, I, I really didn't, I, it doesn't square with my understanding of scripture, but like, I still think it was good for us to talk to him, but I, but also, you know, if you want to sort of live in and yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. It's, it's harder in this world, I think. I mean, it's nothing new, but I think there's it's a, harder in this world. There's a loss of faith in persuasion. Um, because if you're on the left, um, whatever a person says they are is what they are. If you fail to recognize that, you fail to kind of honor their right to self-designate, you're not mistaken or wrong. You're a bigot. You're making the public square unsafe yep. for LGBT plus people, et cetera. So there's not actually room for persuasion there. On the right, if you, well, to use an example, so we ran a book review of Owen Strayan's um, wokeness book. Mm -hmm. I think it was earlier this year or late last year we ran it. And the way Strayan argues in the book, if you acknowledge that ongoing like structural level or systemic whichever term you want to use racial injustice still exists in the u.s you're woke and therefore you're not orthodox hmm. like that's the destruction of persuasion. which by that definition i would not be orthodox right correct yeah. right wow that's... and so yeah you, you can read the review um andrew and rasul did a great job with it um and so Again, you're not dealing with somebody that's wrong or mistaken. You're dealing with somebody who's a heretic, who's a threat to the church, who's a yes. danger. You have a totally and different so, conversation. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a complete loss of any interest in persuasion mm. in this context. And the only way we know how to accomplish anything is through power and intimidation. Um, but the world that that kind of attitude creates is actually a pretty lonely, pretty fearful place because everybody's scared to say what's actually on their mind because yeah. they saw what well, happened to the last guy. Man, I know we're short on time here because I, I uh, <laughs> promised you 45 minutes, but the, good, you're really good. getting it to, to I feel like we're really getting to the meat of the conversation here. Because um, the, <laughs> the, it's been fresh on my mind. Well, okay, take out Elon Musk acquisition of Twitter, right? And by okay. many conservatives, right, that's a fantastic thing. And I actually... I think in general, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm cool with, I, I really want free speech and all that. I, I, so I have no problem with it, but here would be my, my pushback is that we say, okay, we want free speech, but oftentimes I would say we only want that so that our, uh, as long as our tribe is the one that's doing the speaking. And, and so when it comes to, uh, you know, I've seen different conservative leaders that say, this is, this should have happened years ago. Right. But those same ones, I would say, are, are sometimes good at uh, silencing others' voices that they disagree with. Sometimes it's quietly right behind the scenes discussions, mm -hmm. things like that. And so, yeah. on one hand, we want this we want this culture right where there's freedom to discuss. But then, on the other hand, we don't necessarily want to have it both ways, and we're quick to call people like you mentioned heretics that hold a different viewpoint than us and so i don't know dave you can maybe bring some balance to that but that's just something no that, you're dead on and even you know. if it's not overt like calling someone a heretic which i understand that that um that bullet needs to be in the gun maybe but it better be <laughs> it better be used very infrequently and it better be for something that's actually heresy you know when i hear someone say jesus was half man half human i'm like um well that might, you know, or like he didn't come in the flesh. He didn't resurrect from the dead. I'm like, well, that that's heresy, right? But right. to just call someone, and on the other, and to as to your point though, I think there's ways we can also do this that are less overt. Like you can, you can. Sh I think shadow banning. As introduced me to this term the other day, I was that's like, right. what is what does that even mean? That sounds kind of cool though. <laughs> uh, but you can shadow ban somebody, and so I think we're all into having our voice be the dominant one. Um, but like yeah, Dave, Dave, just real, real quick, my, my point with that though is, is like with with in terms of if if okay, the general premise right was that that quote unquote left controlled Twitter right, but mm -hmm. if they really believe obviously as they do issues such as climate change and race and these things that if you have a different view that your view should be suppressed or lowered or shadow banned right, we can't say oh you can't do that and then not all of a sudden not be willing to have discussions and kind of it's hypocritical the same, right same game again I don't, 
Jake, you need to wind us up here because we're we're getting off. Help track. us, help us land, Jake. You wrote a book, right? We should talk about that. <laughs> Tell us about your we book, Jake. Be, we kind of have been. Yes, uh, I agree. Without necessarily making all the things as explicit as yeah, it, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Um, I guess one of the thoughts that I have. I've thought about it with a lot of the social media discourse, um, but it pops up in a lot of places. Um, so like when I was kind of doing my, like figuring out what I believe thing in my late teens and early twenties, I remember I was reading, <laughs> I was a nerd. I was, so I was reading Jean-Paul Sartre, this French existentialist philosopher. I was reading one of his novels because like, couldn't make sense of his philosophy um because i was a teenager and knew nothing so i was reading his novels um <laughs> and i had people at church getting so mad at me about what i was reading and finally again see teenager kind of mouthy i smarted off to one of the youth group workers and i was like okay i want you to show me the page where like i'm gonna flip the page and christianity is gonna no longer be true because i turned the page in this book and they just kind of stared at me blankly. But, but my point was, I'm like, if, if we believe that Christianity is true, if what the Bible says is true, then I should be able to read this book and think about what it's saying, consider the ideas, and at the end of that process, still be able to recognize that Christianity is a true account of reality. And when everyone around you is so fearful um what that tells people is that they're scared of what's going to happen if like in my case if i kept reading these books well what's going to happen and like i it would be very easy for me to say you you believe that if i keep reading these books i'm not going to be a christian anymore because these books are somehow going to discredit christianity and as a teenager maybe i should just believe you then and that's what's going to happen, in which case, why should I be a Christian? Um, I think there's just such a spirit of fear. And for Christians of all people, I don't think we need that. Um, which isn't to say that we should be stupid or foolish or yeah. take unnecessary risks. Because um, you want to raise your kids well. Like, but, you don't want to just... Because right. I, I balance right. this. Because right? like, you, mm -hmm. you don't want to expose them to everything because there's a lot of junk right. out there, right? And so right, right. Of there, course. there's that side of the things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that, that balances yeah. it out. Oh, no, I mean, we have our, we don't have our kids in public schools here in town yeah. because of these kind of conversations. Um, but what we're after is the good. Um we're not operating from a posture of fear and a sense of everything's going to come crashing down. If X goes wrong, right. um, God remains in control of history. God is the author of history. God knows how the story ends. Um, and there are many, many, many times throughout church history, throughout Christian history, when things look very, very bleak, um, yeah. And God acts in a miraculous way. I mean, people forget this now, but like in the early 1800s, there was an Easter service at St. Paul's in London that six people attended. <laughs> and people think of like the 19th century as being this time where like Europe was still Christian and it was this the kind of the good old days, I think is how some people want to think about it. And I'm like, no, it's pretty irreligious for long chunks of time. Like, the colonial days in the U S extremely irreligious in most parts of the colonies. Um, we just have these really weird ideas about history that kind of feed into these fearful mentalities that we have. And I think we need to be able to actually, I mean, it's kind of the thing I like half, half jokingly say with the Brunhof is like, they read acts four and they're like, okay guys, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. let's actually read the Bible. Let's read what it says about God's sovereignty. Let's read what it says about God's providential care for the world, for us, for the lost. Um, and let's actually choose to believe that instead of believing that if this next election goes wrong, the church in America is going to implode overnight. Yeah. Or if this leader I mean, one place where I see it almost more often is when it comes to protecting people 
that are powerful that do wrong things. Like, well, we couldn't, if, if it actually got out that this leader had done X, then all these horrible things would happen. And it's like, well, but the truth matters more than preserving power and protecting men. Right. Uh, and well, so... And, and kind of, yeah. To like circle back to, to your original point here. So, you know, how, how I always come back to this, right? People have Google. Okay. So we say things <laughs> and it used to be, I think in an era where you, the pulpit was revered. There were, I think there was a section of uh, history and you didn't necessarily question that. But whereas now you can just Google very quickly, bam. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that what they said, I don't, there's a lot of people that don't agree with that. And, and so, but to your earlier point, the importance of having those conversations with your parents was so helpful. And that, that would be my point. I think we lost Ezra. We lost Ezra. I'll pick up for him. <laughs> I think the point is that those conversations can happen safely in mm -hmm. in in a family context. And also, um, there's there should be no fear. You mentioned uh, you probably read No Exit or something like that from Sartre. I don't know what you're, <laughs> right. but like yep. if you read that, Dirty hands, yeah, like if, you, if you yeah. if you have um, a framework of Christian understanding of the world, when you read something like No Exit. You don't come away. I wasn't. I mean, I read that in high school. I didn't come away thinking like, "Wow, what profound philosophy." I came away thinking, "Wow, this is not a very compelling way to view the world." And I, I think at at the at the right time, mm -hmm. it's sort of a timing thing. I think there's, like you said, there shouldn't be fear. So there's a. Sorry, I know we're running out on time, but. Joy Clarkson has a new book called um, Aggressively Happy. She's a colleague of mine at Plow. It's a fantastic book. Um, she has a story in there. I don't know when she was kind of going through her questioning and doubting moment. Um, but she had a conversation with her mom where she asked her mom something to the effect of like, hey, Ezra, Ezra's back. <laughs> she asked her mom, would you um, still love me? And would I still have a place in our family if I didn't believe Christianity, if I didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, if I didn't believe all of that. And her mom said, well, yes, of course you would, but I think you would be happier with God. Mm. Um, and that just struck me when I read it as such a good response. Um, just the sense of security and calm um, as you're listening to your child talk about what they're thinking about. And I'm sure it was a very anxious conversation for her mom no. um and yet to be able to just rest in god's promises to us to trust that god's at work and respond out of that confidence it's a totally different conversation than if you're responding from a place of fear and anxiety no. about what you're hearing absolutely jake tell us about where we can find you tell us about your book where's the best place to get it um, so you can buy direct from IVP on the InterVarsity Press website. Bookshop.org is great. Um, Barnes & Noble works well. I, it is on Amazon. I'm not an Amazon fan, but it is on ah. Amazon. Um, if you want to leave a review on Amazon, that, that helps with sales, <laughs> sadly. Um, so yeah, I mean, all the usual places. Um, I've got a website that's just jakemeter.com with a contact form. I'm not really much on Twitter anymore. It's just, is not a pleasant place to be. So I auto post from an app and I don't monitor the account. So people can follow me on Twitter, but I will not see anything they say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. So the website is a better way to get in touch. And then Mere Orthodoxy is the magazine I edit. Um, so you can go to mereorthodoxy.com to see what we're up to there and um, subscribe to the print edition. Jake, it's been great having you, man. And uh, thanks for what you're doing in the kingdom. And uh, Godspeed on the work.